Excuse me, do you work here? I'm looking for Elias Bouchard. He runs this institute. I do have an appointment. Peter Lucas. Lovely to meet you, Brian. Now, am I to understand you don't work here? That's probably for the best. Elias can be quite protective of his people. Never really understood why. I mean, in the end, the only person you really have is yourself. Wouldn't you agree, Brian? Well, plenty of time to make your mind up, I'm, I'm sure. Now, if you'll excuse me, like I said, I have an appointment to get to. You are sure you don't know where Elias Bouchard's office is? Not to worry, I'm sure I can find it. And I'm sure you need some time to get used to your new situation. Good luck, Brian. Martin, isn't it? Do you? I, I, that, that would seem wildly out of character from what I've been told. Please, Martin, I'm not going to hurt you. I just thought we might have a chat. Alone. Yes, that's... Peter, pleased to meet you. Now, how did you know that? Ah, I see. I'm sorry to have disturbed you. It's one of Elias's little jokes. Did he suggest you record a statement today? One that mentioned me? I have a meeting with him today, he suggested. I'm sure he's watching from his office, grinning from ear to ear. I almost thought he genuinely wanted me to meet the team. Oh well. Do I scare you, Martin? Hmm. Probably for the best. And what's Elias like to work for, aside from orchestrating unsettling encounters? And that's not something you look for in an employer, I assume. Almost certainly. How is he as a boss? Oh, that doesn't sound like the Elias I know. He killed people himself? Elias Bouchard getting his hands dirty. Well, well, must be the end times. So what? your advice would be less murder? No, no, it's, it's a good observation. I thank you for it. Well, I'm sure I've disturbed you quite enough for one day. Martin, I have a meeting to get to, and a few things to tell Elias to his face about wasting both our time. Be seeing you, as it were. Must be a relief. Honestly, I thought there'd be more of a scene, but he always surprises me. Please, call me Peter, as you like. Look, don't let Elias get to you. You did very well. Really? I honestly think you managed to surprise him, even if he'd sooner die than admit it. Oh, right, of course. Well, you've successfully managed to remove Elias as the head of the Magnus Institute. So? Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, not in any um, metaphysical sense. No, he's still very much the... How did he insist on phrasing it? Ah, uh, yes, the beating heart of the Institute. But... Practically speaking, he can hardly fulfill his more mundane managerial duties from a jail cell. Not exactly. He anticipated that you would likely find some way to remove him, so he made alternative arrangements. Exactly! To be honest with you, Martin, I didn't expect to be taking over the place so soon, or in quite such a state of disarray. But I'll do my best to keep the place afloat. Oh, what's that look for? You won! I am sorry if it doesn't look quite like you hoped, but here we are. Well, if you could send Melanie and Basira up to see me, I'd like to introduce myself. After that, I'll put through a couple of weeks of paid leave for you all. I think giving everyone some space to try and deal with the loss of Tim and... Daisy might do everyone some good. Oh, and if you want to talk to a counsellor, the Institute will, of course, cover any costs. Don't mention it. I know how it can be with a new boss. I'd like to help you ease into it. Of course. Oh, and Elias said you'd probably be keeping a close eye on the archivist's condition, so I'd be keen to hear any developments. Marvellous. And don't look so down. I know, change can be scary, but eventually it happens just the same. I think we're going to great things, Martin. Great things. Which isn't a great sign, if I'm being completely honest. You talk to him. You talk to him. 
And that's understandable, Martin. Of course it is. Please don't think I'm upset. It's just... not ideal. Shows how much work we still have ahead of us. <laughs> They're already suspicious, Martin. That's not the problem. I had hoped that all this time apart would have given you the space you needed, but... And he beat the odds. Which is good. But it does make things more complicated. It doesn't actually change anything. We've been over this. The sort of power you're going to need relies on your isolation. It needs to be you, Martin. You're the only one who could possibly balance between the two. And how do you think John's going to react to that explanation? Hmm? Do you think he'll accept it calmly? Come through with a well-considered, rational response? Or would he assume he knows better than you and do something rash? That's fair. But I'm not wrong. Martin, this isn't how any of us wanted it to go. But here we are. And if we don't pull this off, it's over for everyone. John included. <laughs> because behind all his bluster, Elias is just like all the rest. He's so preoccupied playing the game, he doesn't pay attention to the big picture. He managed to convince himself that he could get his ritual off first, which would have made all of this a bit moot, but that's not really an option anymore. So it's down to us. You and me. The dynamic duo. It would make things a lot simpler. Well, if your archives were a bit better organized, it wouldn't have taken me almost three months to find the evidence you needed. I'm just saying that we'd all be better off if your archivist actually knew how to archive. Yes. Well. Unless I'm mistaken, I believe I've unearthed a few of Decker's old statements. Of course, I still need to do a bit of verification, but I'm confident they should provide you with all the context you need. Great. Martin, when it's over, you won't want to. But he will be safe. They all will. Anyway, I'm very excited to see this rotor you've put together. Uh, Never uh, had much of a gift for okay. administration myself. Too many variables. Now, this box on the left, that's the library staff, yes? No, no. Can't stand computers. Besides, that's why I have an assistant, isn't it? It is. The extinction. Yes. Not at all. Honestly, that's the sort of thing I normally relish. I've always been a little bit of a gambler, and the higher the stakes, the better. This is different. Good. It's about time. There are two powers that, to my knowledge, have never attempted to fully manifest. Never had followers set them up for a ritual. Mother of Puppets and Terminus. The Web and the End. The Web? I've never really been sure about. If I were to guess, I would say it actually prefers the world as is playing everyone against each other, and so on. The end, on the other hand. The end doesn't really need one. It knows that it gets everything eventually, so why bother? The end manifesting would not be a new world of terror. It would be a lifeless world, devoid of everything. Exactly. It has no reason to truly attempt to enter our world. It's passive, but the extinction... The extinction is different. It's active. It will seek to create a lifeless world in a way that none of the other powers ever would. Some interpretations suggest it might replace us with something new that can then fear annihilation in turn. But I, and those like me, would rather that did not happen. I don't know if such a thing is even possible, but if it is, then yes. Or at the very least, weaken it. I'm still working out some of the kinks, but I believe I have a plan. However, it requires this place, and it requires someone touched by the beholding. Elias was, perhaps unsurprisingly, unwilling to help. Yes! Martin. It's going to be decades, if not centuries, before I get another chance to bring Forsaken into this world. Your last archivist saw to that. Honestly, if Elias hadn't killed that woman, I'd have been very tempted. 
I warned him she was a danger, but Peter. he's always... Anyway, the point is that, yes, obviously, if I last that long, I'm going to try again. But I'm rather keen for the world not to end in the meantime. Martin, this is what we agreed. After the flesh attacked, you came to me. And I've held up my end of the bargain, despite your continued hesitation. Your friends have been largely untroubled by the many, many enemies that they have made. Was that its name? To be honest with you, I thought it was dead. True enough. And as soon as I learned it was here, I moved to intervene. But, well, it turns out I wasn't really needed. And as far as the coffin goes, there's not much I can do about a bull-headed archivist who seems hell-bent on self-destruction. My powers only extend so far. Look, I'm not going to pressure you into doing anything you don't want to. It won't even work unless you're willing to commit. In any case, I have plenty of preparations to work on myself before it's ready. I'll see what else I can find to help with your reservations in the meantime, okay? Just don't hesitate too long. We are on a deadline after all. Right, then if you'll excuse me, I have a family thing to get to. Do we need to? Because, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what's been going on with him these past couple of weeks. Oh. Martin, my patron, hopefully our patron someday, doesn't give me any sort of special insights. I'm not quite the accomplished voyeur that Elias was. I have to keep tabs on things the old-fashioned way. If you like, but... I'm only one person, and I can't keep an eye on everything. As I said, one of the last shreds of the circus delivered a gateway into too close I cannot breathe. I went to help, but was too late. Then your detective friend no, left on one of Elias's wild goose chases. Then John willfully hurled himself into the coffin. I did not intervene, because thankfully, I did not agree to protect your friends from their own idiocy. <sighs> Though actually, he gave it more consideration than I thought he would. If you say so. Regardless, he's in there three days, and then what do you know? He manages to pull himself out of the coffin like a grubby Jesus. And he even brings a penitent thief along in the form of your pet murderer. Does this seem about right to you so far? Now, from my point of view, so far, none of this has been any of my business. We have bigger concerns than this little soap opera you call an archive. What does puzzle me, though, and I mean that genuinely, is why you were piling tape recorders onto the coffin while John was in there. It's a question, Martin. It's, it's not an accusation. Interesting. Were you compelled? But... You should watch out for that. Could be something dangerous. I can't help but notice you're recording right now. Anyway, point is, I'm not your captor or your torturer. I'm not going to tell you to stop talking to him, or even saving him if it comes to it. If that's not a decision you're willing to make yourself, me scolding you isn't going to help. You know what the stakes are now, and I just have to hope you're with me on this, focusing on the big picture. Okay, now I really am running late, so if you don't mind... I'm impressed! And grateful! Even better! I hadn't really thought about it, and now, thanks to you, I don't need to. Yeah. I'm just not big on confrontation. You understand, I'm sure. Of course. Did you read it? And... You don't still think I'm trying to trick you into a grand ritual? Good. For you, keep researching. I'm sure we haven't found all the statements in here that deal with the extinction yet. One of the downsides of not serving the Ceaseless Watcher is that we have to actually look things up. Not to mention the fact that Gertrude was distressingly good at obfuscation. The more you know about our enemy, the better. I have my own explorations I need to attend to. And a, um, meeting to arrange. For you. I'm absolutely delighted with your progress, and I feel you've earned some straight answers. Oh no, that sort of conversation makes me very uncomfortable. No, I'm owed a favour by a friend of mine. I've asked him to stop by, 
when he's back in the country. When have I ever? Oh, come now. What would life be without the occasional twist? Oh, speaking of which, I've had a report of a workplace dispute in the library, and I would value your input. I'm trying to get out of the habit of, what did you call it, sending them away? Then I have good news for you. In my defense, it is still quite funny. I think we're finally ready. Yes. Well, for the most part, to a certain degree, you really need to see it for yourself. You know the tunnels under the Institute. Well, there's something at the center, a... Let's call it a device. Now, our biggest problem with the extinction is lack of information. We know it's emerging, but we don't know how or where. Yes, I very much hope so. If you need more time, good, because I was going to say there probably isn't any. It's very difficult to reach if you don't know exactly where you're going. I will. By tomorrow, I should have my hands on a map, and then we go. You're not going to die, if that's what you're asking, but no, if all goes well, you won't be. How does that make you feel? Excellent. I'm so proud of you, Martin. Perfect. Is everything all right, Martin? Ah, yes, of course. Hard to trust the doors, I imagine. But she's still the same corridors, I suppose. I'm sure... What was his name? Tim. Tim. Very well. This way. Oh, don't worry about that. Ink's practically still wet. Not to mention, if they do change, well, I happen to have something that will change them back. It is. That's lightener too. Do you want to see how it works? Oh, I insist. Watch. Plan reading. Shush. Mm -hmm. I'd stay quiet if I were you. Yes. Make sure everyone's too busy to follow us. They'll be fine. Probably. You could still... Go help them, if you insist. Very good. Come on. The Panopticon of Milbank Prison. Not quite as Smirk originally conceived it, of course. Jonah Magnus made certain adjustments. Why do you think this was chosen as the Institute's location when the prison closed? It's a significant site of power for the beholding. From the tower in the center of this room, you can see everything. I don't mean the cells, Martin. I mean everything. Come on. Mind your step. This comes from an era before safety rails. It's quite simple, really. I want to use the powers of this place to learn about the extinction, what it's doing, where it's manifesting, then we can stop it. Correct. Without a connection to the eye, any attempt to use it would likely end very messily indeed. But thankfully, it just so happens that you hold such a connection. You must admit, you're the perfect candidate. There is, of course, just one other complication. You'll have to dispose of the current occupant. Jonah Magnus, his body, at least, sitting here watching Binding it all together, growing ever older. If you want to take his place, well, yes. Don't worry, though. I brought a knife. What are you doing here, Elias? Don't let him distract you, Elias. Of course, you can take all the time in the world. Elias, then do it, Martin. We're the same, you and I. We don't need anyone else. Watching from a distance, 
that's always who you've been. Have you enjoyed it these last few months? Drifting through the archives, unseen, unjudged. You'll like it in there, I promise. Then do it. Kill him and help me save the world. Martin, what are you doing? Martin, this is not the time for petulance. There are bigger things at stake here. The extinction is coming. Oh. What you said. I see. This is your doing, is it? But you do serve the lonely. No. No! This isn't fair. Do you have any idea what you've done? You knew he must have... No, that's not... You can't. No! Shut up! Fine. Oh no. No. I'm not gonna make it easy on him. You haven't won yet. He doesn't want to see you. I'm not here, archivist. No one is. No one is. It's only you. You've still got time, archivist. Turn around and leave. You've played your part. Now go. <laughs> of course. Or haven't you been paying attention? It's odd, really. You each think you're so focused on the other, but how much do you really know each other? How much time have you spent together when not working, or bickering, or fleeing from that latest thing that wants to kill you? So, what are you seeking? The image you've each created of the other? The people you think you love don't exist. Not really. And that's a very lonely place to be. He doesn't want to see you. Just go. Martin! I tried to tell you. He's gone. He made his choice. And it wasn't you. Yes. Suppose you did. Suppose you did. Where are your friends, Archivist? Yes. Because of you. And... You're alone, Archivist. The last one standing. I did warn you. I did want you to leave, but... Perhaps it would be better if you stayed a while. After all... You can't hurt anyone in here. Yes. What? Fine. It was just a thought. So leave. That's not going to happen. No! Fine! Fine. Where do you want to begin? The start? A lonely youth? My gradual path to becoming an only child? That's the thing, you see, about a family faith. You've got to double down on the believers. My mother had five children over her life, before my father finally drifted away. She was a Lucas to the core, though not born into the family, while my father for all he believed himself keen on a life without obligation, gradually withered away to nothing as she cultivated the space between them. The house was sprawling, our bedrooms were kept as far apart as possible, and changed often as we were cared for by a rotating cast of nannies and tutors. You know, she's still alive. But I still can't picture my mother's face with any clarity. And I consider that a blessing. I'm not even burdened by hatred for her. She is simply someone who exists, far away from me. 
It was the sort of childhood that would not be allowed if we didn't have money. But we're an old family with, shall we say, a remarkably direct line of inheritance. The sort of family where no social worker would even be allowed on the property. But for all that, aside from a few oddities of faith, I don't know how different my upbringing was from other scions of aristocracy. <laughs> from what I understand, severing the connection to your humanity is a cornerstone of an upper-class education. Though I was spared the targeted traumas of boarding school, as my mother clearly believed the danger of friendship was too acute. I suppose to call myself an only child is technically untrue. Two of my sisters still live, though they disavowed the family and moved far, far away. Still, to be cut off from one's family is its own very special sort of loneliness, isn't it? So we all serve in our own ways. The other two, my brother Aaron and sister Judith, well, they weren't considerate enough to quietly grow to adulthood and disappear. They simply didn't have the temperament to thrive in the Lucas household, always trying to instigate games, make friends, connect with people. As far as I'm aware, they were sent away to live their lives with very distant relatives, never to return. I'm sure it's possible my mother resolved the matter in a less pleasant manner, but in my limited interaction with her, she never struck me as a cruel woman, and I would imagine for children that age, the fear and isolation of being uprooted and sent away is just as strong as that of meeting a more grisly fate. I, of course, was the favoured son, being quiet and reserved and, at all points, deeply engaged with my own loneliness. I had no time for books or television or any of the escapes and artificial friendships of fiction. No, I was myself, and that was enough. I would spend my days exploring the wide grounds and forests of our estate, finding the hidden corners I thought that none would have found before me. Though now, I wonder how many generations of Lucases had exactly those thoughts in exactly those spots. As soon as I was old enough, I would run away for days at a time. I would take what money I needed from my mother's purse and hitchhike to any city I could reach. Looking back, I realize how odd it was that her purse was always so full of cash, and I believe it may have been the closest thing I ever received to her blessing. By the time I arrived at whatever destination I had arbitrarily picked, it would usually be night. I would walk around the darkened streets, drinking in the sodium orange, looking at the lit windows of the tower blocks that surrounded me, each one a small, cosy den of warmth and humanity, and reveling in my distance from them. Sometimes I would pass another late-night traveller on the street, and I would hate them. They shattered the distance, my cocoon of quiet stillness, and I wished with all my heart that they would simply disappear. And one day, one of them did. I still remember him well. He was tall and broad, wearing a green raincoat he'd clearly bought before middle age began to set in. There was a thin drizzle that night, one of those rains you can't see but leaves everything glistening and damp and he was struggling with an umbrella. I tried to pass him quickly, but his eyes met mine, and he smiled and asked if I could help him. I can't describe the feeling that passed through me. I can only say that I told him to go away. And he did. Or perhaps I did. In retrospect, it's hard to be sure which of us fell out of the populated world, but either way, the sense of blissful relief, edged with a strange, creeping fear, was something I never experienced before. It was intoxicating. When I returned, I was met by my mother and a small group of stern-faced relatives that I had never seen before, except at funerals. 
They took me below the house and showed me the truth of our family. It was difficult to accept at first, not because I didn't want it to be true, but because it seemed unbelievable that any god could be so perfectly in tune with my heart. I left the house again shortly after and took to the sea. I never saw my mother again, except, of course, at funerals. Some of my most peaceful memories were on the tundra. I had gathered a small group of trusted souls who I knew were loyal and dedicated to my money. They had no qualms or morals about what we did on that boat, and at my request, each signed to the ship under a false name, so I would never have to know who they were. Those lonely nights of sacrifice and waiting, hearing the dreadful sound of my ancestor's whistle drift over the dark and brooding waters, knowing another soul was leaving this world. God, I wish I was there now. Locked in my cabin, staring over the quiet emptiness of the open ocean. But it's moored now, and I came on land at Elias's request. My crew is out there waiting for a call. I think I am now unlikely ever to give them. I will call him Elias, for that's how I've known him for most of our acquaintance though I originally met him when he was still James Wright, head of the Magnus Institute. I considered him a dull little man at first, so keen to watch other people's misery, to lose himself in second-hand pain and drama, exactly the sort of thing I'd always been so keen to avoid. Gertrude was the one that scared me. She seemed to have no interest in meeting me whatsoever, something I appreciated, but there was something in her eyes when she looked at me, as though she was making a calculation, and I was an unwanted integer she was deciding whether to remove. It wasn't until much later that I realized exactly how true that was. Still, it seems I was never a pressing enough concern for her to sail out after me, or even wait until I made port and waylay me. I suppose even she couldn't have predicted how it would all turn out. Thinking about it now, perhaps one of the reasons I lasted as long as I did was that I was, at the end of the day, predictable. A known quantity. I had my little patch, sending my poor lost sailors to their forsaken end, but I rarely stepped outside of it. When I think of all those I met who traveled in this secret world we found ourselves in. Gertrude, Simon, Mikhail, even Rainer. There are plenty whose lives might well have been easier with my death, but it was rare that I strayed outside my habits. Maybe that's why, when I crossed paths with Adelard Decker, we ended up talking, and he told me his theory of the extinction, something that stayed with me even after he died pursuing it. The thing is, the loneliness I crave that fills my heart with that reassuring unease relies on distance from other people. But a world without people at all, or at least anything I would recognize as people, it is meaningless. Without the lighted window in the distance, how am I to see myself apart from it? No. Such a world would be terribly dull, and scares me in a very different way. A fear I am happy to offer up, of course, but one that I would prefer not come to pass. My instinct was much like the others. I thought that if I could complete my ritual first, then the potential birth of the dreadful change would be meaningless. I started it, shortly before Simon convinced me to join him in his little space experiment. It was interesting, of course, but in the end a tremendous waste of money just to scare a single astronaut. But I had it in my mind that it might distract from my true attempt. I had commissioned the services of architects, designers and sociologists, all under a variety of pretenses, and had secured a plot of land near Oldgate East. I was going to build a tower block of my very own. 
Oh, it was a marvel of design. Deceptively spacious apartments, yet no room quite big enough for a double bed or decent-sized sofa. Cooking facilities that seemed adequate until you tried to do more than microwave. An office space in every flat, but without a door, so you could never truly escape your work. None of them had more than a single bedroom, though each had a main bathroom and an ensuite, which is a small touch I was very proud of. The lower four levels were left deliberately empty, so anyone living there could only see the people below from a distance. The lights of the city that they were removed from. The windows were thick, and every wall had soundproofing inside it. The corridors were full of false doors, so even though each floor was designed to minimize the probability of residents encountering each other, it would seem as though they were crowded in by doors that would not open if knocked on. I made the elevators very small. Then, I offered the rooms at a ridiculously low price for their central London location, and then screened the applicants mercilessly. I prioritized those who were newly moved to the city, graduates who needed cheap accommodation and were moving into intensive, high-stress jobs that would give them little time for socializing. Recent divorcees were also very suitable, especially those whose friends had sided with their partner. I crammed them in, pushing them to stew in a cocktail of distant lights, empty corridors, and lukewarm takeout for one. The plan was to wait until those inside reached a critical mass of loneliness and despair. Then, all at once, lock them in remotely, cut off their internet and phone lines, and leave them to die alone in their single occupancy, professional dooms, as the Forsaken emerged from their terror. I called it the silence, though to be honest it was mainly because I thought they had to have names can't say if the title was desperately inspired. Then, of course, Gertrude Robinson happened. Do you know how she did it? What a devastating weapon she used to derail my plan. The newspaper. She tipped off someone in The Guardian. I still remember seeing the headline there in black and white the loneliest building in Britain. Trouble is, everyone I picked was white, middle class, so people actually cared, falling over themselves to declare it emblematic of the problems of the modern world. Ugh. The thing pieces started to pour in. The applications started to drop off, and I was up to my neck in community outreach programs. No way to salvage it. Years of my life and a sizable fortune down the drain. She didn't even have the decency to kill me. It really knocked me back. It took me years to find myself again. I returned to the tundra, tried to forget. But the trouble was I'd tasted the game now. I was still hungry for more. I suppose that's why I was so keen when Elias contacted me. We kept in touch, of course. My family helped fund the Institute, and he'd always been good about tipping me off to potential victims. Going through something horrific can leave you feeling very isolated indeed, especially if you know no one else will believe you. And of course, he knew I'd find it hard to resist a wager. If I could convince one of his staff to willingly pledge themselves to the lonely, it was all mine. He even let me pick the victim. He was so sure the prize of the Institute, the Panopticon, and a willing vessel to use it would be just too much for me to resist. And he was right. Just didn't go quite as I'd hoped. You know, this is one of the first bets I ever made with him that I've actually lost. But I guess that's how hustlers work, isn't it? They lose and lose until you're willing to put it all on the line and then the trap shuts. So I suppose that's probably why I reacted so rashly, trying to rip his victory away, keep you here. But it looks like I might have underestimated my opponent once again. Oh, he got you.
And you won't. Not from me. I'm done. I'm not saying another word. No! No! Leave me alone! Elias Bouchard, Elias, Elias Bouchard, Elias, 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 Elias Bouchard, Elias, 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 Peter, now Peter, 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 now Peter, 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 Peter,